Welcome everyone to the C-Suite Marketing Perspectives Podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host. And today we've got on TJ Waldorf. Now, TJ, you're the CMO of One World Sync. And what's interesting about the growth trajectory of your company in the discussion that we're going to have today is all about the gap in perceptions, the gap in knowledge in terms of what you're actually capable of and what your clients know and internally what employees know. And how do we manage that for success overall? I think you'd mentioned that over the last three years, your company has gone through nine different acquisitions where all of us companies, we always have gaps in knowledge of what our clients perceive us as and what we have as capabilities. We're always trying to expand that. You're in a quite an accentuated situation where you're actually physically growing leaps and bounds in what you can do. But this conversation applies to all of us in the B2B in terms of what are we doing to make sure that we're managing those gaps and perceptions externally and internally. If you wouldn't mind expanding on your background here just a little bit, and then we'll get into the gap discussion. Sure. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. So my background over the past, call it 20 years, has spanned marketing, sales, customer success, sales apps. I've seen all parts of what you would consider the revenue driving piece of the organization or the go-to-market piece of the organization. And for the last three and a half years, I've been with One World Think and currently the CMO. And part of my remit is not only a traditional marketing function organization, but I also have business development as well as a group we call community enablement, which is a, I think a unique function to a company like One World Think. So we can talk more about that if you want to, but that's the overview. Fantastic. You were very passionate when we first started talking about this gap that exists. Tell me a little bit about how do you think about that gap to begin with? What kind of problems that creates? And then let's get into how you think about solving those problems, especially as you're changing and adding to your capabilities on a regular basis. Yeah. I'll give my CEO a lot of credit for this because he's the one that at first initiated this with the organization. And the way to think of, we call it the consumption gap internally. You can think of it as a perception gap as well, or, or a knowledge gap even. But effectively, if you were to visualize the Y axis as the capabilities of the organization and the X axis as both your customers' understanding of your capabilities, as well as your internal stakeholders, so your employees, their understanding of your capabilities. And to the point you just made, there always tends to be some gap between those two things. In our case, it has been accentuated because we've gone from over the last three and a half, four years, we've gone from a single product company to making nine acquisitions and expanding our, you know, our capabilities and our platform immensely. So you can think of you know, folks that have been with the company for a long time. They knew us as one thing, the same thing with customers. We've got customers with us for 20 plus years and they knew us as one thing for that long. So now there's a lot of education that needs to happen to make sure that they understand who One World Think is today. So that in a nutshell is how we think about it. Tell me about the pros and cons. We can think about this as obvious, but from your CEO and you and on Dan, you've made major initiatives to address this consumption gap. Tell us a little bit about maybe the dark side of it. If we're not doing this, what's happening in your organization? I'll start with the external piece. If there's a gap between our capabilities and what our customers understand that we can do, then we're simply likely not selling them more of what we can offer them. So. It's super important that we're doing everything that we can do, both from marketing perspective, as well as sales and anybody else that's talking to a customer, technical support, so on and so forth, to constantly educate the customers on who we are today and what those capabilities look like. And then you and I were having just some banter beforehand and a big way to make sure customers understand what you can do is to make sure that your employees understand what you can do. So closing that gap between what employees understand and what you can actually do is really, I think, a fundamental and just absolutely critical piece of this whole gap closing exercise, if you will. It has bottom line impact. We're supposed to be very focused on pipeline, very focused on revenue generation. So, and it gets reflected in where do we put a lot of our time, where we put a lot of our resources and energy into getting net new clients. But what you're talking about is this, I liken it to this whole world of net reoccurring revenue. How do we expand our current revenue base with our existing clients? And we've right. all heard back to before we even got into the business thing, that it's much easier 
to get revenue from existing clients than it is to get net new logos. And so we can't do that if there is this gap in terms of what they even know we're capable of. Because we should be spending as much time or a very decent amount of time on how are we educating? This means campaigns. This means marketing efforts to our existing client base, marketing efforts to our existing employee base. The same way that we put together these campaigns for those getting net new logos in, is that the takeaway in terms of this time energy needs to be spent on this? It is. And just to put that into perspective, One World Think compared to some of the other companies that I've worked for, we have far more existing customers than some of the other businesses I've been part of. And so the ability to educate those customers, to take on and enable them with more of our capabilities that we've either acquired or built over years is a huge opportunity. And that's something that we're constantly talking about to our teams and our board and customers about. So when you think of that go after net new, that's still an important part of any organization's go to market. But the opportunity for us, because we have over 17,000 customers, be able to go to that 17,000 customers and say, look, you've known us for 10, 15 plus years. We're doing this one thing for you today. However, there's a whole lot more that we could be supporting you with. And you can do it all with a single vendor that you may be using other point solutions for in the market today, which just simplifies things for them. It reduces costs. There's a whole lot of benefits from the customer side to do that. And then the benefit for us, obviously we've got a customer that leveraging us for more and should become more sticky. Tell us a little bit then about the importance of that internal focus, because I think obviously at the upfront, okay, we're not going to educate our clients if our own employees don't understand this in our capabilities. Yep. But how do you think about it in terms of educating the internal audience? in how you do that and the best practices and ways you do it. Maybe I start with how I think maybe the trap, and I'll include myself in this in the past, has been you're doing a lot of external marketing, a lot of external campaigns, a lot of blogs. You're putting a lot of content out that is intended for customers. And you just expect that the sales team will go read that stuff and the customer success will go read the blog. and. The reality is they're busy. They got a lot on their plate. They got a lot to do. They've got quotas to meet. They've got other objectives and to stop and pause to go do that. If that's what you're relying on as a marketing leader, as a marketing team, I think that you're going to fall short. You know, I'll give some specific examples, but just like you run campaigns and programs externally to get customers to understand your capabilities, you have to do that same thing internally and have programs and campaign motion internally to get your employees to also understand it and really just constantly make sure that you're doing everything that you can as a marketing team to make it easily accessible, to make it front and center and just make sure that it's there. And just to give us an example or how much time and effort in terms of you're the CMO. So all campaigns that come out are under your purview. Are you spending 5% of your time on employee education campaigns? 10%. What's a way of thinking about this in terms of, okay, I'm probably spending 0% right now. How much effort should I be spending on that? I don't know that there's a precise number. When I think about our company and our team, there's obviously a lot of repurposing that you can do. So if you put something out that's customer facing, one thing that we do, for example, is we do a twice monthly, we call it a marketing digest. If we have a new case study, or a new webinar coming up, or maybe we landed an article on CNBC. We basically package all that up into a marketing digest that's an internal email and send that out twice per month. And so again, we're not expecting our employees across the company to go find that stuff, whether it's on a blog or wherever, we're packaging it up and then putting it in their inbox. That's one example. Okay. Yep. But a lot of companies aren't even doing email newsletters these days. Yet. No. You know, it's 40-year-old technology and still in terms of pennies on the dollar in terms of the ability to get messages out to an external audience. So an internal newsletter, I think it's a fantastic idea. Tell me a little bit about what does that mean when you are educating employees in terms of then what is expected of them to do as a result? How much more engaged are they or what are some of the ways that you're seeing the benefits of this? Manifesting yeah. internally. A very tangible example would be, let's say that we have a piece of coverage on Forbes or CNBC and we've got our 
chief product officers quoted saying something. One way that a sales rep could use that is they could take that link to that article and put it in an email and say, hey, Mr. Mrs. Customer, you should read this. Or they could grab that little quote out of that press release or that article, put that in the body of the email because that would be the most relevant thing to that customer and say, hey, our chief product officer said this. I think it's going to resonate in a big way with you. By the way, if you want to read more, here's the link to the article. And I think the tendency would just send the link and hope the customer reads it. And we all know that we get hundreds of emails. I feel like I get hundreds of emails a day and to stop and do that is sometimes a challenge. So again, I think it's just it's giving little, call it tips and tricks like that. Like how do we make it easy to use the content that's going to serve their objectives and their goals, their purpose and what they're trying to do on a daily basis. It's so important that what you're talking about sharing on a daily basis, because in an ABM world, they can't just sell, sell, sell. Yeah. They've got to be adding value. Increasing yep. your stature as a trusted advisor and an expert to their prospects. Putting that digest together is fantastic in terms of, oh, here's all these really incredible things that are tools that I have that I can use. And then they know instead of if things come out piecemeal, they get left, right? And they okay. get forgotten and they don't get read. Because that yeah. one of the things that you said early on is there's a massive problem throughout the B2B industry. I'm not talking about your company, but yeah, is that. Over 60% of content that marketing creates, sales doesn't think is important. Or 60% that's hard to hear as a CMO. So a big part of that is if they don't read it, it's not important. Nobody's going to ever say, hey, I never read. I don't understand that really important thing you put together. Yep. A big part of this is making sure that you're creating a cadence where they're like, hey, I know there's one or two times a month this is coming to me that there's going to be good information that I can use. I think that's a really great takeaway. Just to add to that, I think the other thing, that biweekly digest is just one piece of the bigger picture. We joined the monthly sales all hands call. So that's another opportunity to say, hey, here's stuff that's out there that you could be using. We do a quarterly all employee newsletter, another chance for us to put it in front of everybody. We do a quarterly all hands call. Another chance to put it in front of everybody. As marketers, we know like repetition and seeing stuff over and over again, that's when you're actually going to get somebody's attention and get them bought in. It's never just going to be one thing, one email, one phone call. It's got to be a, a true program. That external and internal. Yeah, exactly. And everything that you've been talking about here is content. This is all sharing important content, important accomplishment, product news. If you could just take a step back and say, sure. as the CMO, how important is content to these campaigns? One, it's not important at all. 10, it's actually vital to the overall growth and success of the business. Why would you put it on that scale of one to 10 and why? I'm a listener of your podcast. I'll just put that out there. And I've heard you ask this question. And initially my answer would be 10 for sure. Everything's content. This conversation is content. Emails are content. Case studies are content. It's all content. However, <laughs> If you don't also have the distribution aspect of that, if the tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, did it actually fall? You have to have the distribution mechanism in order for the content to make an impact. So yes, it's a 10 for me, but without the distribution element, it's more of a challenge. It was just like getting sales. They're the first consumers of our content. Yeah. If we don't distribute it correctly to sales, then it's going to fall flat on its face. Yep. There's all kinds of forms of content. Yep. What is the importance in your mind? Forbes magazine, put it this way, you might have heard me say this on the podcast before, content marketing solves problems, mm -hmm. but leadership sparks conversations. Yep. In, in today's day and age, we're dealing with a B2B buyer that is consuming more content, waiting longer to ever even want to talk to us. Mm -hmm. The whole self-serve buying trend here. It's more incumbent upon marketing to be sharing content at these campaigns that help sparks conversations earlier and earlier in the buyer's journey. You typically don't do that with product feature content. Sure. You do that with content that is coming as an expert in the industry that is helping to educate, helping to advise. I'm just yep. putting that into the thought leadership bucket. Sure. Now I'm going to ask you that same question on scale one to 10. How important is thought leadership content to the overall growth of the company and vitality of the company? One, not important at all. Ten, vital. Yep. I think you have to think about it. It's not an either or thing for me. I think you have to think about that buyer's journey. And so again, for me, that would be a 10 because 
There's the poll up you read, but you've seen the LinkedIn B2B research. 5% of your buyers are in market, 95% of your buyers are not in market yet. So how are you getting the 95% that are not currently looking for you a solution? In some cases, if you use ERP systems as an example, you might not buy an ERP system for every five, 10 years. If I call you today, the chances of you being ready to have a demo conversation are slim to none. But if you're constantly putting out thought leadership and getting these potential buyers to know who you are and to think of your company, that when it comes to the point that they're ready to start looking, I think your the odds of them getting into a conversation with you or shortlisting your business, your company, your brand skyrocket. Again, it's a 10 for me because I think it's part of the overall contact strategy and journey. I don't know if you've heard me share this before either, but there was another CMO. She's named Jamie Geyer. She's three-time B2B CMO. And she had a phrase that just stuck with me. In all the years and decades I've been doing this, it was like, wow, you just really taught me something. She said, today's brand is tomorrow's demand. 100%. I've heard the old Brad and Angelina, the Brangelina thing, yes. like brand format or brand gen. They're one and the same because again, the buyers aren't ready to be quote unquote demand gen or demand capture today. Those are the ones you need to be thinking about six months from now, a year from now two years from now or further out. I think you have to have both. And if you don't have the brand piece that's getting folks to think about you the way that you want them to, chances of them having a conversation in a year are slim. Yep. And you've got to be, you can't not afford to not cater to that 95%. You just can't. And one of the things that she went on to say, she said, if we do this correctly and the brand turns into demand, yep. then we're taking cycles away from the sales process because then the individual sales person comes in if the brand of the company the expertise the trusted advisor status of the company constantly been raised and supported then the individual salesperson does not have to do that as much at the beginning exactly we're shortening sales cycles because we're queuing it up in the right way all marketers need to think about that since i have the business development function i think it's even more of a heightened sense for me because those business development reps are calling in cold a lot of times and I need my brand to at least be known so that when they say, Hey, I'm from one world Think and this is what we do. They hopefully go, yeah, I've heard of you. And that makes the conversation a little bit easier. The job's always going to be hard, but if I can make it just a little bit easier to get into that discussion, then that's great. Yep. Our goal is to make that easy as we can. That's right. What I wanted to do is ask in terms of you've been doing this for a while now. So. In terms of the learnings that you've had, we started out, we did some of these things and we just didn't see the consumption gap, this perception gap. Here's some things that we learned along the way that you could share with the rest of us in terms of, yeah, we did get a good return on that. We're focusing more in this kind of an area. What are some of the things that you can get us up to speed on in terms of, we want to start doing more of this? I'll use our example of going through nine acquisitions first, but I think that you can easily translate that into a company that's made zero acquisitions. I think one of the traps that you can get into if you're very acquisitive, like one world think has been is you'll acquire one company, you get very focused on making sure that your customers know what those capabilities are. And then literally in our case, like two weeks later, you acquire another company and then you want to make sure that they know those capabilities. And then you stop, you either stop or you're not as deliberate about ensuring that the one prior continues to be recognized and understood the whole ensuring that you have the steady cadence, just don't forget about the things that came before, because there are going to be customers that didn't see that one email or that press release or that webinar because they either weren't with the organization that you work with or for whatever other reason, there can never be enough communication. It's gotta be the right communication relevant and timely, but I think there can never be enough just ongoing. And does that, all those communications just have to tie into the base of who we are? Hmm. Because as you add capabilities and like lots of tech companies out there, they're constantly evolving their platforms and new releases. And so whether yep. it's acquisitions or new releases, and we're talking about this shiny new thing right here, yep. but there's still the mothership that we're adding to the capabilities of. How do you balance the overall communication of the mothership with the new acquisition or the new release? Yeah. Here's an example. We, let's say we released the feature on the core mothership six months ago, and maybe we haven't seen as much adoption that we expected or wanted to see. And then we acquire a new company or we build a new capability. You can package 
that new capability or capabilities up with that core functionality that you launched six months ago as almost a new launch. But there's no such thing as only being able to launch a product or only being able to launch a feature one time because there are customers that are going to, they may have not seen that initial one and they go, oh, I didn't know you had that. We told you six months ago, but now that now they know it. I think that there's, if you don't see the initial traction that you want to see, launch it again and package it up with the new stuff. That would be my advice. You just defined my communication cadence with my teenagers. I package it again. Say yeah. it again. Say it again. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I think that's really wise because we get into the, if we do so much for a major launch, we think we want to get to an end zone and we yeah. want to move beyond. And we forget that there's an entire world that we're one small part of what they're thinking about and what they're retaining, what they're learning and what they think is important. And I think that's a really good relaunching and packaging those together, I think is really good. Yeah. And even if that same person that saw the email still at the organization, to your point, they are learning and seeing a lot of stuff on a daily basis. But depending on the industry you work in, there may be a lot of movement. There's new people coming in and they would have never seen that. Here's an opportunity to get that new person that's in the role that you're serving to see that capability you launched six months ago before they were even there. There's a lot that when I talk to CMOs, that I put in the category of reframing the conversation. Yeah. And what you're talking about here is as you're making these introductions, but you're putting that in context with the trends in the industry, whether it's AI or whatever it is, but there's always external factors here. And a big part of our job in educating is redefining what the problem is and how big that problem is for the companies that we solve and that we have this view of the future. We have a point of view and we're bringing those together. It, I think a big part of this gap is understanding the true problem, framing mm -hmm. the problem correctly, and then having a point of view that is unique and different. Yep. And that's what we all do. That's reframing the conversation here. And I've never thought though, this is why I bring it up in terms of the need to reframe the conversation internally. Yeah. Because defining the impact and the problem, everybody from product development to marketing to customer success to sales, if they truly can understand that the real problem that is being solved and the impact and how that impacts our business, the business yeah. of our clients, then they're going to make better communications. They're going to make better products. They're going to sell better. Everything works better. Truthfully, I've never really thought about reframing the conversation internally. Would you believe or would you agree that's a big part of this? When we talk about this internal communication program, yeah. that's a big part of it. A hundred percent. I can give you an example. One World Think is a company where in the product content, we say we're the leader in product content orchestration. Basically what that means is we sit between brands. If you think of somebody like a Colgate, PepsiCo, so on and so forth, and the retailers on the other side, Amazon, Walmart, Kroger, Albertson, so on and so forth, we help the brands get verified, trusted, accurate product content to those retailers. And if you look at all the industry data, e-commerce, as a percentage of retail is anywhere between, depending on the categories, anywhere between seven and call it 15%. And so in some cases, if I'm a sales rep for One World Think and I'm having a conversation with the retailer and their e-com sales are only four or five, six percent, they may go, that's a small portion of our business. What you're talking to me about right now, that's not our focus. The reframe on that is, and we've done research on this and people can go to our website and find this research is that what we call digitally influenced sales. We're always looking at stuff on our cell phones. Even when you're in the store and you've got your cell phone up, digitally influenced sales, and there's starting to be some research, some anecdotes come out on this. That's a three X multiple over what the actual attributed econ number is. Even if that 6% is what you can actually track, the digital experience is influencing everything that we do, everything that we buy. That Internally for us is the reframe, even if they're saying it's only 6%, that's what they can track. That's fine. However, we have data and we have research that shows consumers are looking this stuff up online. And if their product content is not accurately reflecting those products, the chances of them even going into the store to buy them drop. You completely reframed the conversation there yeah. and redefined their problem and their challenge for them. Yeah. That is a fantastic example of that.
And then we can immediately understand. If we don't understand that reframe internally, then we're never going to communicate it. We're never going to sell it. We're never going to cross sell it. Right. There's equally as big an opportunity in that gap, that consumption gap of knowledge, the perception gap. That's a beautiful way to put an accentuation point on the end of the conversation. <laughs> I have one more question though for you. Sure. And that is, we've talked about a lot. If there was one key takeaway that yep. you wanted people to have in this conversation, what would that be? I would bring it back to the core of the discussion, which is closing this consumption gap or perception gap in that. As marketers, we can tend to be almost myopically focused on the external because that's what's going to show up in the very clean results of pipeline and bookings, so on and so forth. And all this discussion is that's a mistake. If you don't get your internal stakeholders, your employees, your team members, your colleagues to close their own consumption gaps or their own perception gaps of what you can do, it's going to be, you're just making your job that much more difficult to get the external stakeholders to understand it. So I would just bring it all back to closing that consumption gap. Yeah, it's interesting because in like job interviews and things like that, and you're like, Steve, if we were to bring you on board, do in the first 120 days. Yeah. Nobody usually talks about an internal campaign component. So everybody's wanting to hear, what are you going to do to get us more business? But what you're talking about is the fundamentals that underlie success. That gap that happens internally is step before we actually need to be thinking about how are we changing perceptions externally right. at the same time. But the creation of the work that is going to make the difference and drive the pipeline. We have the people that do that work. They have to understand this and understand it. Well. Yes. Thank I you. I think so. That, that's what I believe. But yeah. Hopefully this was helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. And if people had follow on conversations, questions that they wanted to have, is it appropriate that I give out a link to your profile on LinkedIn? Absolutely. Yeah. Very active on LinkedIn. So happy to. Fantastic. TJ, thank you. Thank you very much for taking your time out and sharing these insights with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Stephen.